All right, up next is our Marys. She wrote in and said, I'm a Venezuelan immigrant to America, and many fellow Venezuelans and American media portray Donald Trump as the American version of Chavez. How would you compare these two characters? How would you compare Obama and Chavez? What are the parallels between the situation in Venezuela before Chavez and communism and the current situation in the United States? And what are the differences? Well, hello. How are you doing this evening? Hi, I'm fine. And you? Uh, I'm very well. Thank you. Um, is there anything you wanted to add before we dive into this uh, side by side comparison? Um, well, I can tell you I can have or I can give a different perspective. Because I grew up in Venezuela, I was born and raised there, and I grew up there uh, before Chavez and after Chavez. And then I come into this country and I'm seeing things, and I just would like to know your perspective. Right, right. Um, can I, you know, look, you know the history, uh, I'm somewhat aware of the history. Do you mind if I just bring people up to speed with a little bit of the history that I think is is relevant before we start talking about of course the person of course so Venezuela is teetering on the brink of of it seems to me at least fairly significant economic and social collapse is that too strong a way to put it uh, is it, you, you've certainly got more experience there than I do no, no I think it's quite correct and it's, it's destroyed. My country is destroyed. Right. That was my impression. Uh, and um, this is one of the huge tragedies of Venezuela and, and other countries as well, Argentina and, and Brazil. You know, from the 1920s to the 1960s, it was incredible. Huge economic prosperity. I mean, discovery of oil reserves. What is it? Largest in the world? Bigger than Saudi Arabia? It's crazy. I think so, yes. I mean, not only was Venezuela the richest country in Latin America, this will blow people's minds looking at, at where it is now. But Venezuela in 1950 had the fourth highest per capita GDP in the world in the world. Now think of the G7, think of the Western countries. 1950 had the fourth highest per capita GDP in the world. Now, of course, Europe had gone through the war and so on, but nonetheless, uh, it was uh, really something. Now, during this time period, you know, we always think that democracy is the solution. I mean, Venezuela was governed by a variety of military or quasi-military governments, but um, had a stable monetary policy. It had clear legal property rights, Mm -hmm. uh, pretty low taxation and um, very low foreign debt and public debt. So, like, looking just at the 1950s and onwards, Venezuela is like, boom, going to be a world power. Uh, right on the brink of um, tipping over into a truly sustainable, potentially sustainable first world economy. And uh, whew, it was, um, as, as is so often the case, um, there was a um, a sort of right-leaning or, or military dictatorship. And in 1958, as is so often the case, this left-leaning reformists put an end to this sort of quasi-military uh, dictatorship. And this, of course, is, you know, uh, communists are involved in this and socialists are involved in this, and I'm sure the Comintern had its finger in there somewhere there more political revolutionary arm of Soviet Russia and so on. And um, what do they do? Well, they go through the usual socialistic land reform and land redistribution and uh, takes the property holdings of the wealthy landed classes and distributes them in very inefficient ways, not based on productivity or cost or price or anything like that. And uh, then they jack up the tax rates, uh, and uh, they went from like 12% to 36%. And of course, lots of complex layers of taxation. And um, of course, because they've got all this money, they start spending like crazy. Uh, and of course, it seems like, wow, you know, we're paying more taxes, but look, all these great services we're getting because it's all debt-based and it's all, you know, just kicking the can down the road. And um so 74 to 79, under Carlos Andres Perez, 
Uh, this is when the state completely metastasized. It just went nuts. Um, iron industry, petroleum industry, the steel industry, all nationalized. Ah, they belong to the people. So we'll let the bureaucrats and the politicians take them over and pretend it's the people. And, of course, they used all these oil revenues, massive social spending, and, uh, you know, financing its um, import substitution programs and trying to create some sort of local competence in various industries. 1976, nail in the coffin, right? Chavez is kind of an effect of these. 1976, the petroleum industry is taken over by the government. And that, of course, is a huge industry and was responsible for a lot of the economic growth, if not the majority of it, from the 20s until the uh, the fifties, and uh, so of course you know cranks money through the government, and they can use that as collateral to borrow even more. And there were of course very high oil prices. OPEC was doing its jack up the um, oil prices under uh, Jimmy Carter, and this is when you had the lines around the block mm. in America for um, for oil and so on, mm-hmm. and. Um, that, you know, for a while you're flying high with all this borrowing and you're flying high with these incredibly high oil prices. And um, it was a strong currency, right? The the Bolivar. Is that Bolivar? Bolivar? Yes, Bolivar. 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 Uh, Bolivar. Uh, str- was one of the strongest currencies all throughout Latin America from the 50s to the 80s. And then um, October 1983, known as Black Friday in Venezuela, the Bolivar had the biggest devaluation in its entire history. And this just, of course, you know, the government's printing money and, you know, the usual socialist nightmare that goes on when the government gets control. How am I doing so far? Is this relatively close to what you have heard or now? Yes, this is what we what we learn in school uh, history. Yes, it's, it's accurate. Okay, good, good. All right, I'm glad you're learning this stuff because it wouldn't be taught in American schools if this was the history as <laughs> was to some Right, so the end of the 1980s, the whole thing's starting to come apart, right? You've got massive debt, crazy unsustainable spending programs, and of course, economic regulations. Boy, what do the leftists love to do? They love to control and choke like weeds, like like algae on a Florida beach. They just cram up the economic regulations. Uh, and of course, this creates massive inefficiencies. You devalue the money, uh, which means that you've got to have this crazy protectionist trade policy, and you've got increased poverty, economic stagnation, and so on. And of course, once the high oil prices weren't propping up all this spending, boom, you get uh, economic stagnation. And um, starting in the 1990s, um, well, Venezuela had kind of turned into a petro state. And uh, it was either going to go under or it needed some market reforms, like it needed some free to return to some of its free market uh, principles. So, you know, they got some money from the IMF and in return, they, you know, reduced tariffs and tried to reduce some gas subsidies and liberalize uh, liberalize some of the uh, economy. And um, that's, you know. Gave it a little bit of breathing room, but uh, inflation was never really falling below 30 percent throughout the 90s, which was a, a giant mess uh, and makes it very, very difficult to plan for the future. And so there was kind of a lukewarm market reforms, but um, people didn't really believe in them much and they didn't have a huge amount uh, of effect. And um, uh, Hugo Chavez, who was a lieutenant colonel at the time, it was an attempted coup in 92. It sounds uh-huh. like a beginning of a bad rap song. And um, they, um, he didn't, uh, he didn't get into power at that point, did he? No, he didn't. And later in February, um, I don't remember what year. I think it was next year or two years later. He attended another coup, but right, they all went to jail, and then. Uh, Rafael Caldera, uh, during his uh, his second uh, regime, uh, he he freed them. They uh, he pardoned them, so they right, got right. out of jail. So, according to um, some experts, the average annual per capita GDP growth from 1960 to 1997 was minus one. The minus point one percent, and I believe it. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure if that's the that's the right number. 
And if I'm honest, uh, before Chavez, I really didn't care about politics. And after him and after all this disaster, I do care about politics. But uh, the problem in Venezuela, uh, they were not communists per se. Uh, Chavez came to power saying that uh, we've been uh, we've been here in this country. Uh, this is a great country, but the politicians are all corrupted. We have had corruption for 40 years and blah, 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 blah. And uh, and only uh, two parties are right. the ones that can control Venezuela. So it's time to change that. So, but it's it's true. The policies, they were corrupted uh, and the policies were not the best. But there were many people that they were thinkers. For example, uh, there was Arturo Uslar Pietri. He would say a thousand times, you have to saw the oil, the saw like a plant. And he, yeah. he he used to say this because he said all the, the, the money that you get from the from the oil industry, just put it there in the primary sector. Let's let's get uh, let's get the industries uh working. Let's uh let's work with tourism. If we work only with tourism, we will be super rich because Venezuela you have everything. You uh, where I am from, from Maracaibo, is super hot all the time. But we have a lake and it's fresh. And then you're bored and you take a plane and in 45 minutes, you are in the mountains and you can see the snow. So it's, and but they never did that because they didn't care bureaucracy and it was corrupted. It's true. But then Chavez happened. And it was worse. Well, and sorry, just, just to set that stage. So by 1998, Fifty percent of the Venezuelan population is living under poverty, uh -huh. because of course the economy is shrinking. There's massive inflation, and the population is growing faster, and so the, you, it's less money to go around. And so, um, yeah, Chavez gets in power, and he's oh, we're going to change everything. We're going to make everyone wealthy again. And man, did he ever hit the gas on messing up the economy, on controlling uh, socialism, uh, just the whole. Massive at all. He took over more and more industries. You've got exchange controls, price controls, uh, and uh, they use the PDVSA, the state-owned oil company, as just this giant mechanism for buying votes uh, and and selling jobs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he turned into the kind of dictator, or at least semi-dictator, and using the uh, the country's judicial system to to persecute those who disagree with him. You know, again, the usual. Expansion of state power followed by pursuit of anybody who criticizes that. And, um, and using, it was a mess. Using voting machines that he bought himself uh, to make sure that he was staying power. Right. Right. So, I mean, it took a long time uh, to, to hit this uh, kind of mess, right? I mean, a half century uh, since the socialists uh, really first started to get in power and began bleeding away all of the wealth that had been accumulated since the 1920s during a relatively free market, prosperous, not involved in European wars and, and big oil revenues kind of environment. You start bleeding that away. And it's like that old saying about, you know, some guy said, uh, said to a friend of his went bankrupt. And the guy said, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, very slowly, and then all of a sudden, right? And and this, it's like a slow decline, slow decline, feels like it's going to be a soft landing, and then boom, the country just falls off the cliff. And this is, of course, um, the, the West is the West is risking all of this as well. Exactly. So the yeah, so the idea that um, you know the the idea that Donald Trump is going to nationalize all of these different industries the idea that he's going to put in ex currency exchange controls and and massive extensive price controls and that he's going to manipulate the judicial system to persecute anybody who disagrees with him the f i mean this is not even remotely what uh, is is going to happen i mean it, it, the opposite in many ways i mean this guy's piling more and more taxes and regulations on donald trump wants to uh, simplify the tax code and reduce regulations. Um, the only possibility of any overlap that I can think of is in the realm of tariffs. But um, I believe that Donald Trump is using tariffs to get better trade deals, not that he's dying, dying to make a big giant 
economic wall around America because he's been an international businessman for all of his career, at least most of his career. So the idea that he's going to want to cut off trade around the world with America, I don't find particularly believable. Uh, I assume it's a position of leverage. And of course, if he can replace income taxes with tariffs, well, uh, that's basically how the founding fathers founded the com uh, country and got the country going. So saying that that's somehow anti-American is to say that the beginning of America is somehow anti-American. So I think that um, he is not, uh, he's not, not only is he not similar, there's many ways in which he's uh, the direct uh, and polar opposite. I, I totally agree with that. Many people compare him uh, with Chavez because According to them, he's arrogant and he's promising and promising things that he cannot fulfill and blah, 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 blah. But I don't really think that they are that similar, not even in personality. Uh, Chavez was in the military force. Donald Trump is in the workforce. Like he is the one creating jobs for everybody, whether they like it or not. Yeah, Donald Trump is a creature of the market. Exactly. Chavez came out of the military and went oh. into politics, and as far as I know it, never ran a damn business uh, in, in his life. Never. Never had any understanding of market forces, never had to deal with bureaucrats who were chipping away at his profit margins, never had to deal with inc incalcitrant government unions, never faced the loss of his personal capital or his entrepreneurial abilities because of all of this. Uh, so um, I, I would put him much closer, or Chavez would be much closer to the uh, Obama camp in that they both had this mysterious um, follow me off uh, the, the cliff, my friendly lemmings kind of appeal to certain sections of the population. And they had a charisma that or a personality structure that allowed other people to project hopes and dreams into them. And they made wild promises uh, that they had no particular capacity to fulfill. And if you compare what they promised versus what was achieved, you know, you can look at Chavez with the economy and Obama with the economy and Obama with race relations and Obama with foreign relations and Obama and uh, Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Clinton, SOS, uh, stability in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. What they promised versus what they delivered was so completely opposite that um, I would put – Chavez is on the left and the Democrats are more on the left. So the idea that you'd compare Chavez to Donald Trump uh, would be to me, uh, you'd want to do that to avoid the inevitable, inevitable comparisons to uh, people like um, Obama and Hillary Clinton. And I agree with that. And another similarity that I see is that uh, Chavez and the government here, they always have a scapegoat because uh, – I've been trying to do this, but this hasn't worked because, well, because of this and this and that. In the case of Venezuela, is the empire, the U.S. Uh, they are the scapegoat. Right. 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 And, of course, uh, Trump uh, wants to lower corporate tax rates. You know, I, I'm not wildly familiar with Hugo Chavez's running platforms, but I'm pretty sure it didn't have much to do with lowering corporate tax rates. You know, Trump wants to take them from the current sky high levels down to the levels of, say, Germany, which remains an economic uh, powerhouse and so on. So, you know, Trump's policies don't violate mathematical or economic laws. Uh, and um, he's not he's not on the left. I mean, the, the, this oh, idea he's he's arrogant. I don't know. Arrogant is just what idiots say about annoying opinions they can't disprove. He's arrogant. I mean, what does that mean? I mean, uh, two and two make four. Don't be so arrogant. It's like, well, am I right or am I wrong? Well, we're it's, all uh, different. It's just an adjective that people shoot when they can't shoot down an argument. We're all different. This is a diverse world, so everybody is different. Um, I see... So I, I see that they compare uh, Trump with Chavez because of their personality. But as you said, clearly has nothing to do uh, the way they they um, they manage economy. For example, the the platform for for Chavez was very similar to the platform of government here. Oh, you vote for me, I give you a dish, uh, a dishwasher or um, or a washing machine, or like that you hear. Oh, I'll give you a phone, a cell phone. Right. Right. And um, this borrowing from the future in order to bribe the present is it's banana republic stuff, you know, and it, it used to be an embarrassment in America to buy votes by promising free stuff and to make people dependent on the state 
so that they'll always vote to keep the state big and they'll never vote for tax breaks. I mean, people don't vote for tax breaks if they don't pay taxes. And they kind of get that their money comes to them from other people's taxes. And so people who are dependent on state money or state jobs or state controls or state subsidies or state protections or whatever, of course, people who are dependent on state money are going to be against tax breaks because they get that that means it's going to mean less money coming to them. Exactly. Papa State is there and he's going to take care of me. Many, many people in Venezuela, uh, when Chavez was giving them their share or whatever they call it, uh, well, I don't need to get a job because the government is giving me this amount every month. So, And besides, if I go and look for a job, I'm going to get less money. So I prefer that Papa State take care, takes care of me. And I see that that is happening here. Um, I saw this um, documentary about Ayn Rand, and she predicted that if we continue this country continued the way she saw it. Uh, she, she saw the situation back then. She said that if we continue that way, we're going to end as a socialist slash communist country. And sadly, I think it's kind of happening slowly but surely. I saw things in Venezuela that I'm seeing here and I'm really scared. And I really don't know what to do for people to wake up. Well, you know, I don't know how to, to wake people up either other than by doing sort of what I'm doing. And if there's a better way, I'll hopefully uh, start doing that or follow whoever does that. Uh, I do think that um, Ayn Rand is entirely unrecognized for the amount of predictions that she made that are, are true. Now, D Danconia Coppa from Fran Francisco Danconia, was that, wh where was that uh, mine? Francisco Danconia? I think he, he was one of the characters of uh, of Atlas Shrug. Yeah, no, no, you're right about that, but he's got the um, the copper mine. Um, I, I can't think remember which. So. No, yeah, no, 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 the wine. He, he was the, the guy who owned the wine uh, factory or something like that. No, he had copper. He had copper factory. And he, uh, sorry, I'm not going to give any spoilers because people should absolutely uh, read that book. But uh, let me just, Mike, if you can have a look at this, uh, look this up, because it was in, it was in a Central or Southern American country that he had this copper mine. Uh, and uh, the fact that she dealt uh, I I around the world uh, in Atlas Shrug, talked about Europe and talked about South and Central America and so on, um, was important because she was predicting that if, the governments continue to pursue these socialist policies, then the economies are going to collapse and people are going to end up hunting pigeons and bats and all this kind of stuff. And the fact that this has all come true, and she wrote Atlas Shrugged a couple of years before the socialists took over in, um, uh, in Venezuela, right? So the fact that she's able to see through the tunnel of time more than a half a century to where Venezuela is now while writing about it in the 1950s well, come on. I mean, the people got to give her some credit for that, but I doubt they will because, uh, you know, they want to be, be a lot of people want to keep uh, keep trying to control uh, all of these uh, things. So all of these people. So. Yeah, they, they want. I, I, sorry, go ahead. They want they want to control you. They want to control even what you think or what you say. And uh, they do you rob your dignity because how can you have dignity if you don't feel useful for your community if you don't have a job if you don't provide by yourself for yourself and for your family right right and there is of course the great offer the great offer that the state will make which is that we will find a way to suspend reality for your benefit forever mm-hmm we will find a way to suspend mathematics for your benefit forever. We will find a way to suspend the laws of economics for your benefit forever. And this, you know, with reference to the, the, the great last call with Amy with regards to this is the deal that the devil offers. This is the devilish deal. I will suspend reality for your benefit forever. And of course, since the devil 
nor human beings have no capacity to change the laws of nature, of mathematics, of human nature, of economics, there is no possibility that nature can be suspended forever, that reality can be suspended forever, that mathematics can be suspended forever. That is the delusion. And people act as the, the idiot. In a farming family, you know, there's, there's one in every family. <laughs> <seems like. laughs> of course. And, 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 you know, what you have to do in a farm is you have to eat and you have to keep your seed crop for planting in the spring. Now, if you want to have a full-bellied, big-assed, burp alicious winter, all you have to do is eat your seed crop. It's right there. You can make it into bread. You can spin it into flax. You can bake it in a cake. You can make a muffin. You can snort it. You can eat your seed crop. And, you know, come January, February, March, it's starting to look pretty good because you're hungry. It's no accident that in England there's this starve yourself Lent thing that happens late in winter. It's like, well, we got no food anyway other than our seed crop, so... We might as well make a festival out of not eating. Yay. Mm. And, you know, there's always the idiot. And the idiot says, oh, come on, let's just have some of that seed crop. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Nobody's going to know. And he'll, yeah, he'll go and take it. He'll go and take it. And, you know, maybe it's okay. But the problem is, if you eat 5% of the seed crop, you've got 5% less to plant in the spring now, don't you? And so you have a little bit of less money next winter. Uh, so a little bit of fewer, fewer crops, less food next winter. So next winter comes along, and the guy who was hungry before is more hungry now because you've got less food. So he's got more incentive to eat some of that seed crop. Oh, um, nom, 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 so good. Let's grind it up. I can make a paste. I can make a snowman. We can eat that. Make it out of wheat. And so he eats another 10% of the seed crop and everyone's like, oh man, well, we barely made it through that winter. Not next winter for sure. We're not going to eat any more seed crop. But the problem is 5% the first year, 10% the second year, you're now down 15% of your seed crop. So next winter it is really hard to get through to the spring. So you eat and you plant and you eat and you plant and you eat away at your seed crop. And then one day, one day, You've eaten everything that you've grown. You've got no seed crop. And it's November. And that's what happens. How do you starve to death? Very slowly, then all at once. How do you go bankrupt? Very slowly, then all at once. How do you experience social collapse? Very slowly, and then all at once. And it took 50 years for Venezuela the welfare state has been running in America and in Europe for 50-odd years. It started with a little bit more capital, and of course, there have been some additional innovations and some remnants of the free market along the way. But those are the stakes that are coming up in the American election. Exactly. Do we have any more seed crops to eat? I don't think so. I don't think America can make it through another winter. Metaphorically. Yeah, and talking about uh, winter and crops and pilgrims and Puritans, uh, people don't know or don't remember, or maybe because they're not teaching that in school, that this country started as a communist country, if you see it that way, because everybody had to work together to get the crops, and, and everybody had to cooperate, and what happened? Everybody was starving. And then what was the solution? You're responsible for this piece of, of the land. You're responsible for this one. And if you work, you eat. You don't work, you don't eat. And that's what made this country great. Because you're an individual. You're responsible for you, for yourself, for your well-being. And if I'm helping myself, if I am somebody, I am helping my community. But many people... Don't see that, don't remember that, or don't learn that. Right. Right. And, you know, how, how do people learn these lessons? So how do you awake from a daze of unreality? Well, 
you you wake up from pain. You wake up from suffering. You you most people don't wake up from reason. They don't want to. They 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 think that one more day, one more year, it'll 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 work around, it'll turn around, something will get better, something will improve, magic will happen, the oil price will go up, something will change, there'll be some new invention, you know, like John Galt's uh, invention in Atlas Shrugged, there'll be something that makes it go for another generation. And of course, that's but that's already happened, the, the computers. Computers made it go for another generation, would have never made it otherwise. And maybe there will be some magic new thing, but I wouldn't hold my breath for it. Maybe there'll be teleportation, maybe. <laughs> Who knows, yeah. right? I mean, Nobody knows. Nobody knows, but I wouldn't put my, you know. May- maybe I don't need to go hunting. Maybe a healthy moose will just trip and fall right in front of me. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well. But I wouldn't put a lot of money on it, and it's a big risk to take. And so what will wake people up is is pain. You know, it, it's, it's, it's sad. But there's it's no way that it cannot be painful at the moment. Right, because even if everybody said, "Wow, you know, we got to go free market tomorrow, we got to shrink the state, we got to open up uh, trade options, we've got to get rid of bureaucracy, we've got to get rid of regulations, uh, we got to just trade, 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 freedom, 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 property, property, property." That's what's killing well, this country. Well, it's going to be painful no matter what. Sorry. That's what's killing this country. I mean, I am a teacher by trade, right? But I could do something else. You know, I I I could start my own business. I can prepare coffee and I can prepare muffins and I'm always get compliments and people tell me, oh, you should open your own, uh, your own cafe. And uh, and when I think all the things that I have to go through, all the permits and all the laws and all the rules and blah, 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 blah. I, I say, you know what? It's not worth it. And I don't have time or the money to invest to do this. I don't think that this country was founded with so many rules and so many laws and so many permits it was free market i have something to offer you like it you buy it if you don't like it you don't come back but if you like it maybe you will tell your friends and then i will make money and they will be happy right right but and it's it's that's that it's that level of simplicity that we need to get back to exactly Uh, this uh, constant hyper regulatory state uh it's like um it's sort of like being asleep and a spider is making its web across your nose and across your mouth. And, and you don't wake up from it. And, and you, you know, it's not any single thread that's the problem. But sooner or later, you just ain't getting enough air. And the problem is, of course, is that you, this is a paralyzing spider. So by the time you realize you don't have enough air, you can't wake up and tear the webs from your face. It's too late. It's too late. You know, the things that start as the bad habits that start as spider webs end up as chains. And so, I mean, in America or, or other Western countries, if, if the welfare state ended tomorrow, of course, people would be happier in the long run, but it would be a lot of pain in the short run. People have adapted to it. There's a big change that they would have to go through, and it would be a great deal of suffering. Of course, it will be less than if it happens of its own accord, but of course, governments don't like to initiate actions which are perceived as painful by the population i mean other than war right because okay. war you know patriotism and and uh, all that uh, but governments don't like to initiate actions that cause pain to the population they are willing to let things get so bad that they can say wow it's really terrible that this happened and so we'll work we'll try to we'll try to fix it We'll try to fix it. Exactly. They so, create you know, the, a problem. I mean, if they, if they ended it tomorrow, the suffering would be relatively short, but it would be quite intense. And the longer it goes, the worse it's going to be. How much would have to change now in Venezuela for people to um, become free? Because, of course, now you've got a couple of generations who've grown up in this socialist hellhole. What's happened to their entrepreneurial instincts? Well, as it turns out, as I saw in China in, in I guess, 16 years ago, uh-huh. uh, in the markets in China, I mean, these guys had been under communism for a generation or two or three, and um, they were able to become entrepreneurs fairly easily. So um, it's hard to say. Uh, but the sooner the problems would be dealt with, the easier it would be. But um, there would still be quite a bit of pain now. Yeah. I, 
I agree with that. And it would take a person, probably somebody who is not a politician, uh, to do that. To Yeah, Trump's to, coming in and he's telling the truth. System's unsustainable. It's not going to work. Exactly. We've got too many people dependent on the state. I'm sorry if you don't like the fact that math is math, but don't get mad at me. He's arrogant because he's quoting accurate numbers. It's like, well, I think actually you're arrogant in thinking that numbers can be wished away on a whim. Well, how many so, managers are there that are arrogant? I don't care. If you do what you have to do, with, he's okay and he's working and the numbers are there. Why would you care if they are arrogant? If they're doing their job. So. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, the arrogance is the people who, uh, Donald Trump's never going to run. Brexit will kill us all and destroy the British economy. And, and I mean, the, the, the arrogant people, the scaremongers of the arrogant people, the people who say, well, if there was no welfare state, all the poor people would starve and die in the streets. And if the government didn't control health care, all the poor people and sick people would starve and die and expire in the streets. You don't know. You don't have a clue. Fear mongering is the ultimate arrogance because it's claiming that you know for certain the disasters that are going to result from future choices and future actions and that's the beauty the future is a haze that's why we need principles because we can't predict the future we don't know the outcomes of our actions we don't know the fog of war or the fog of friendship sometimes so we need principles because nobody knows what's around the corner of five minutes from now so that arrogance is on the part of the pundits who say they know for sure what's going to happen for better or for worse, when certain events occur. That is hubris beyond imagination. Exactly, I agree. I'm so glad that you're saying this because uh, many people in Venezuela, they say, oh, do you like Trump? But they say, I never liked him, but what are you going to do? What are you, who are you going to vote for? Seriously. Um, and no, because he's like Chavez and um, Trump is the American Chavez. And I understand that they never been here. And they cannot, they don't know. But I, I feel that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in a place that I have some privilege or I have uh, this advantage that I have lived in Venezuela before and after Chavez. And I'm living here and I see things I can compare. But I'm glad that somebody like you is seeing it, somebody who is unbiased and maybe the message will get there. Well, I'm sort of in a unique position to talk about these things because I've been so enormously skeptical of politics for most of my life as a public intellectual. So um, hopefully when I say things that are interesting and I have evidence behind them, people listen because they know I'm just not another political hack, but uh, have been significantly opposed to uh, political action for most of my public career because what choices really were there that could ever achieve any kind of power. But here's the thing. Now, this is sort of, uh, Maria, this is the last thing that I sort of wanted to say, which is not to say the last thing we can talk about. But, um, you know, people can afford to be lazy if they're rich. People can afford to not think if they're subsidized. And that's really, really important to understand. So people who are like, Trump is X, Trump is Chavez, Trump is Hitler, Trump is... Jiminy Cricket, Trump is a Smurf, Trump is orange, Trump is Cheetos on my face, Trump, well, whatever it is that people are saying, they can afford to say stupid, inconsequential stuff because there's no particular reward for them in thinking clearly, and there may, in fact, be significant negatives for them in thinking clearly. Thinking is hard, is and thinking which brings you up against social opposition Oh, you find this positive about Trump? You're crazy. You're a racist. You're a... Uh, like, who cares, right? You know, as Tom Sowell said, a racist is, is just a conservative who won an argument with a liberal. But um, So people can afford to indulge in stupid, bigoted, prejudiced, idiotic non-thinking if the government's paying them whether they think well or not, Right. Exactly. If if, uh, if if you get think tank funding because you oppose Trump, okay, well, why would you want to think clearly, like blindly oppose Trump? You know, it, it, why would you want to think clearly about it? You know, it, it is a, uh, it's an old saying that says it is impossible to make a man understand something when his income depends upon him not understanding that thing. 
And so if you're going to face like eye rolling and I can't believe it and, and uh, social ostracism and academic or, or career problems or, you know, your girlfriend is going to get mad at you because you, you hate whoever, right? I mean, you know, then, okay, there's a lot of um, reasons to not think, right? In the same way, you don't go to the grocery store when your house is full of groceries, <laughs> Maybe unless you're meat love. But anyway, you you don't go hunting when you have already got food. And you don't think when thinking gives you negative outcomes. And not thinking doesn't harm you. In fact, not thinking, oh, I'll just get my money from the government. Oh. Where's that money coming from? How is it sustainable? How is it going to last? What's going to happen when it runs out? You know what the national debt is. You know what the deficit is. You know what the unfunded liabilities are. You know there's nothing in Social Security. You know that it can't possibly last. You know that mathematics is inevitable. Thinking that the government is going to spend forever is like thinking you're going to live forever. Uh, it is irrational, childish thinking. So what is the negatives of refusing to think when the government is subsidizing your very active non-thinking? Or and so why would you when, think when you know, somebody can, else is thinking for you? Oh, the well, yeah, they're, they're doing all the work, me. right? Yeah, some, somebody, somebody's opening that cafe that can get taxed so these people can get their welfare. Somebody's working hard creating some business so that it can be taxed so other people can get the welfare. Somebody's thinking. Somebody's getting up. Somebody's working. Somebody's taking the risks. Somebody is doing the work that other people are profiting from. And so what is the harm for them? of saying stupid stuff like, Trump is Chavez. Well, doesn't matter. Doesn't, because they don't have to be right. They don't have to think. They just got to wait in the mail for the check to come. Wait for the check to come in the mail. Now, that changes, of course, when the government runs out of money. When the government runs out of money, suddenly you got to start thinking and pretty quickly. And uh, that will change. And then, you know, People who don't think uh, won't do very well, and people who do think will do well. Right now, people who don't think are doing just fine, thank you very much, and the people who are thinking and working hard tend to be doing rather poorly because they're getting taxed and choked with regulations and tariffed and scorned and called exploiters and, you know, when Obamacare is hitting their workers. And, I mean, it's just it's not a lot of fun for entrepreneurs these days. So Not at all. What? Yeah, so, you know, they'll start thinking when – it's more painful to not think than it is to think. Right now, it's more painful to think than it is to not think. So they're not thinking. And at some point, it will become more painful to not think than to think, right? And, so, you know, if you've got to go hunt, you know, uh, you know if, you, if you wait too long, well, you're really hungry when you go hunting. And that doesn't give you a lot of energy for running and throwing and grabbing and whatever it is, right? So it might be too late. Uh, at some point, at some point, it just becomes easier to get up and go hunt rather than stay hungry. And so then you got to plan and you got to do all that thinking and track and get your team together and sharpen your spears and you work because if you work and think because it's easier to work and think. And the government has kept that reality away from people for generations, but it'll come back pretty quick. I totally agree. Now I think. Uh, what you mentioned about the government running out of money, that would make good show how the government can run out of money. What can we do mm -hmm. about it? That would be a great question. I will, uh, I will add it to the list <laughs> uh, near infinite of shows I would like to do. Because, yeah, there's lots of historical examples. I mean, people can just look at my fabulous presentation on the fall of Rome. Uh, for more on that, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but you can uh, you can take it in bites. YouTube will remember where you were when you pick it back up. But uh, I really, really appreciate the call and listen from from somebody um, from Venezuela who's seen all of this stuff go down. You don't want to be in the sequel that's kind of just like the original. And so I appreciate you uh, giving us both a platform to talk about these ideas. Can we avert the disaster? Seems unlikely, but we can be people who were right about it coming, which will hopefully give us credibility when the inevitable rebuild occurs. So thank you so much for calling in. What great callers. You know, I I say this every week and I feel it even more strongly every week. I am I'm honored and privileged to be uh, at the heart of these amazing conversations. And uh, thank you, of course, uh, so much to everyone for calling in. Thank for your you honesty, very much. For your curiosity. Yeah, for your, your stimulation 
of, of what it is that we do. Uh, I'm immensely proud of bringing these conversations to the world. If you want to help us out, uh, you know, August is a hungry month. August is a lean month. I know people getting ready to go back to school. They're buying stuff. They may be going on vacation. They may be taking vacations. But please remember your friendly philosopher and his need for carbs and uh, protein. Uh, if you can go, please, to freedomainradio.com slash donate. You can sign up for a subscription, 20 bucks a month. You know, it's less than a coffee a day, uh, and it really does help the world. Uh, and you can also uh, go to um, uh, fdrurl.com slash Amazon if you've got some shopping to do. It helps us out. It doesn't cost you anything to use our affiliate link. You can, of course, follow me on Twitter at Stefan Molyneux and fdrpodcast.com to share the shows, to review the shows. And last but not least, youtube.com slash Radio. Well, you're probably already here if you're watching this. Uh, thank you so much for all of your support. It's more necessary now than ever, and we need it more than we've ever needed it before, as I think the world does too. So fdrurl.com slash donate. Thanks everyone so much. Have a great, great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. This is one of the huge tragedies of Venezuela and, and other countries as well, Argentina and, and Brazil. You know, from the 1920s to the 1960s, it was incredible. Huge economic prosperity. I mean, discovery of oil reserves. What is it? Largest in the world? Bigger than Saudi Arabia? It's crazy. I think so, yes. I mean, not only was Venezuela the richest country in Latin America, this will blow people's minds looking at, at where it is now. But Venezuela in 1950 had the fourth highest per capita GDP in the world. In the world. Now think of the G7, think of the Western countries. 1950 had the fourth highest per capita GDP in the world. Now, of course, Europe had gone through the war and so on. But nonetheless, uh, it was uh, really something. Now, during this time period, you know, we always think that democracy is the solution. I mean, Venezuela was governed by a variety of military or quasi-military governments, but um, had a stable monetary policy. It had clear legal property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty low taxation and um, very low foreign debt and public debt. So, like, looking just at the 1950s and onwards, Venezuela is like, boom, going to be a world power. Uh, right on the brink of um, tipping over into a truly sustainable, potentially sustainable first world economy. And uh, whew, it was, um, as, as is so often the case... Um, there was a, um, they love to control and choke like weeds, like, like algae on a Florida beach. They just cram up the economic regulations. Uh, and of course this creates massive inefficiencies. You devalue the money, uh, which means that you've got to have this crazy protectionist trade policy and you've got increased poverty, economic stagnation and so on. And of course, once the high oil prices weren't propping up all this spending, boom, you get uh, economic stagnation. And um, starting in the 1990s, um, well, Venezuela had kind of turned into a petro state. And uh, it was either going to go under or it needed some market reforms, like it needed some free to return to some of its free market uh, principles. So, you know, they got some money from the IMF and in return, they, you know, reduced tariffs and tried to reduce some gas subsidies and liberate, uh, liberalize some of the uh, economy. And um, that, you know, gave it a little bit of breathing room. But uh, inflation was never really falling below 30% throughout the 90s, which was a, a giant mess uh, and makes it very, very difficult to plan for the future. And so there was kind of a lukewarm market reforms, but um, people didn't really believe in them much and they didn't have a huge amount uh, of effect. And um, uh, Hugo Chavez, who was a lieutenant colonel at the time, it was, it was an attempted coup in 92. It sounds uh -huh. like a beginning of a bad rap song. And um, they, um, he, didn't, uh, he didn't get into power at that point, did he? No, he didn't. And later in February. Um... Sort of right-leading or, or military dictatorship. And in 1958, as is so often the case, this left-leaning reformists 
put an end to this sort of quasi-military uh, dictatorship. And this, of course, is, you know, uh, communists are involved in this and socialists are involved in this. And I'm sure the Comintern had its finger in there somewhere, the more political revolutionary arm of Soviet Russia and so on. And um, what do they do? Well, they go through the usual socialistic land reform and land redistribution and uh, takes the property holdings of the wealthy landed classes and distributes them in very inefficient ways, not based on productivity or cost or price or anything like that. And uh, then they jack up the tax rates uh, and uh, they went from like 12% to 36%. And of course, lots of complex layers of taxation. And um, of course, because they've got all this money, they start spending like crazy uh, and uh, of course, it seems like, wow, you know, we're paying more taxes, but all these great services we're getting because it's all debt based and it's all, you know, just kicking the can down the road. And um, so 74 to 79 under Carlos Andres Perez, uh, this is when the state completely metastasized. It just went nuts. Um, iron industry, petroleum industry, the steel industry, all nationalized. Ah, they belong to the people, so we'll let the bureaucrats and the politicians take them over and pretend it's the people. And, of course, they used all these oil revenues, massive social spending, and, uh, you know, financing its um, import substitution programs and trying to create some sort of local competence in various industries. 1976, nail in the coffin, right? Chavez is kind of an effect of these 1976 the petroleum industry is taken over by the government. And that, of course, is a huge industry and was responsible for a lot of the economic growth, if not the majority of it, from the 20s until the uh, the 50s. And uh, so, of course, you know, it cranks money through the government and they can use that as collateral to borrow even more. And there were, of course, very high oil prices. OPEC was doing its jack up the um, oil prices under uh, – Jimmy Carter, and this is when you had the lines around the block wow. in America for um, for oil and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, for a while you're flying high with all this borrowing and you're flying high with these incredibly high oil prices. And um, it was a strong currency, right? The the Bolivar. Is that Bolivar? Bolivar? Yes, Bolivar. 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 Uh, Bolivar. Uh, strong, was one of the strongest currencies all throughout Latin America from the 50s to the 80s. And then um, October 1983, known as Black Friday in Venezuela, the Bolivar had the biggest devaluation in its entire history. And this just, of course, you know, the government's printing money and, you know, the usual socialist nightmare that goes on when the government gets control. How am I doing so far? Is this relatively close to what you have heard or now? Yes, this is what we, what we learn in school. Uh, history, yes, is, is accurate. Okay, good, good. All right, I'm glad you're learning this stuff because it wouldn't be taught in American schools if this was the history as <laughs> was to some. Right, so the end of the 1980s, the whole thing's starting to come apart, right? You've got massive debt, crazy unsustainable spending programs, and of course, economic regulations. Boy, what do the leftists love to do? All right, up next is our Marys. She wrote in and said, I'm a Venezuelan immigrant to America, and many fellow Venezuelans and American media portray Donald Trump as the American version of Chavez. How would you compare these two characters? How would you compare Obama and Chavez? What are the parallels between the situation in Venezuela before Chavez and communism and the current situation in the United States? And what are the differences? Well, hello. How are you doing this evening? Hi, I'm fine. And you? Uh, I'm very well. Thank you. Um, is there anything you wanted to add before we dive into this side-by-side uh, -side comparison? Um, well... I can tell you I can have or I can give a different perspective because I grew up in Venezuela. I was born and raised there and I grew up there uh, before Chavez and after Chavez. And then I come into this country and I'm seeing things and I just would like to know your perspective. Right, right. Um... Can I, you know, you know the history. I'm somewhat aware of the history. Do you mind if I just bring people up to speed with a little bit of the history that I think is, is relevant before we start talking about of course. the person? Of course. So Venezuela is 
teetering on the brink of, of, it seems to me at least, fairly significant economic and social collapse. Is that too strong a way to put it? Uh, is it you, you've certainly got more experience there than I do. Uh, no, I think it's quite correct and it's, it's destroyed. My country is destroyed. Right. That was my impression. Uh, and um, 